All right. Well, welcome to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, and I'll be your host today. And today we have a subject matter expert in the hot seat who is willing to say, ask me anything. Now, our session today lasts for an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and attendees alike. And questions and comments are always welcome. If you have something you'd like to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and I'll share it for you. Otherwise, feel free to just go ahead and, and interact with CJ and ask your questions as we go. Now, our topic today is how to avoid being the next HR nightmare or maybe the next HR headline in the newspaper, you know, some of those awful things that happen. And I'm really excited to introduce today's subject matter expert, Ms. CJ Westrick. And let me tell you a little bit about her. So CJ's been involved in human resources management and consulting since 1990. She started as a baby, so she uh, is quite precocious. She has a bachelor's degree in business management and has had her SPHR, which stands for Senior Professional in Human Resources, national certification since 2002. So what does SPHR mean? Well, the easiest way to put it is it's the HR equivalent of an accountant's CPA. And this certification provides you, the client, with the confidence that CJ has successfully proven her HR knowledge and must continue to learn to maintain the certification. Less than 5% of all HR professionals in the United States are SPHR certified. So CJ is definitely a smarty pants here in the hot seat with us. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to CJ, and she's going to just share with you some of the, the things that she's seen in her experience and any questions that you have for her. Let's just see how this goes. So take it away, CJ. Thank you, Patty. You've done your homework on the SPHR and everything. <laughs> and it's like, I'm glad we finally got the sound going. Yes. Um, it's like, Christine, do you have anything specific that you'd like me to target on or just in general? Um, yeah, so I have an HR background as well. So um, I came in specifically to try to see if I could get some feedback or your sense on um, the current law that is going through the uh, California legislature on how it, um, independent contractors are going to be defined as employees and mm -hmm. trying to get your sense of what do you think um, businesses are going to be doing to adapt to that. Okay, that um, the California Supreme Court actually ruled on that a year ago last March. So it was March okay. 2018. And so there's been a lot of activity since then from my clients, from attorneys, from the legislator because I know that right within about three weeks of that happening, there were a lot of people that marched on Sacramento because in one way, you know, we've turned into a gig society. There's so many yeah. people that are doing the, the odd job, you know, on their own. And this pretty much just slammed them to the ground. So on one hand, California saying, oh yeah, you know, we're very pro-business, but on the other hand, then they just squashed it. Um, what's been happening since then is that, um, I mean, some of it I've gotten, I've always had a lot of companies that have come to me and convincing me that they have in true independent contractors. Mm -hmm. um, what the California Supreme Court ruled on really wasn't new and different. All it did was it took the 21 point test that had been used and brought it down to three. Okay. And to be honest, wow. those three points, I, you know, it's now it's called the ABC test instead of the Borello test that had the 21. And I always start with C and work my way up, and I rarely ever have to go up to A because C and B are just the killers. C means that the person who's acting as an independent contractor has to truly look like a business. And every time I've got a client or a company comes to me trying to convince me this is an independent contractor, it's almost guaranteed they're not. Because if it was a true independent contractor, they're not even thinking of that. They're just thinking of them being another vendor. And, you know, they're not sitting there trying to convince me that, you know, Office Depot is an independent contractor for them. But it's the same thing because an independent contractor is supposed to be an actual business. So, you know, the things that, that California's always looked for is, 
Do they have a business license? Do they have some kind of liability insurance? Like I've got professional liability. A lot of companies can get by with a general liability. Do they have marketing collateral? And, you know, do they have more than one client? Because okay. often I get a company who's like, oh, you know, no, no, no. They just work for me. I don't want them working for competitors. That's not a company. You yep. don't just have one. So if you kind of start there, and then the second one is the most controversial, B. Because B talks about um, that the independent contractor cannot replace an employee or do what an employee does or do basically your core service or product. So we, you know, I'm a consultant. So if I bring on someone I call a consultant as, or an independent contractor as another consultant working for me, that won't work because consulting, HR consulting is my business. I know there are some companies that um, have, you know, I, I've got, actually I know two different accounting firms where they're using all of their little bookkeepers out there as independent contractors. And it's like, no, without those people, you have no business. That is your core service you're providing. And so, you know, if you think it through that, and um, I think the real clincher for me on, I go very conservative because the penalties are so steep. And um, so, you know, last year, I know some of the law firms that I go to a lot of legal updates and some of the law firms are saying that, all right, in the past, you know, we've often hired like other attorneys to take our overflow or to work on a special project or something like that. And they said that they are now turning those into employees. If you come and work, even on this one case, you come on as a short-term employee and then go back out again. So it's, you know, when the law firms and most law firms are pretty lazy about following HR laws as a rule because they've, they've told me flat out, well, we feel we can argue anything. So we're not as concerned on being totally compliant. Um, and I've heard this a lot from the people trying to do their HR in a law firm that it's a struggle all the time. And so for the attorneys to turn and now decide that, okay, they can't, they need to bring these people on as employees was a real eye opener. It's like, okay, they're actually taking it seriously. And so with most of this, I mean, I know that there's, you know, been talk in the legislature about what to do. Um, I know a guy that, that actually goes up into Sacramento and is on the committees for the insurance industry. And they have, and it's it really, it's coming down to lobbyists. Okay. A strong enough lobby to where they are actually getting themselves pulled out as being capable of being independent contractors still. Same with the real estate people. Um, but others are still not in, bundled into anything. And they're talking about it. And, you know, it's like, I would like to see them lighten it up or do something to make it because it seems kind of counterintuitive to one hand, you know, be pushing the advancement of the gig society and then, you know, slapping them down every time somebody does something. So they need to be better at defining, which they've had a lot of trouble with for years on even any of the laws that they come up with. I mean, I'm still waiting for them three and a half years later to better define the sick leave laws <laughs> so that they're not so anti-business. And um, so while, oops, I can't hear you, Patty. I can see you're talking, but I can't hear you. I heard something, oh. uh, I heard something on, I think it was NPR this morning. They were talking about on the, um, about California labor law. And they were saying that some of the gig, the gig businesses, like, you know, you're talking Uber and Lyft and Postmates and, you know, some of these, and that some of them would fall under the independent contractor, but not all of them. So how do you, how do they get that granular to decide this company does and that company doesn't? Well, a lot of that, if you look back, because Grubhub is kind of who started this whole controversy, um, because they're, you know, they're contractors, filed a lawsuit. And at that time, originally, the lawsuit came out to where, all right, they have enough independence, they're on their own vehicles, they have a choice of whether or not they pick up a gig that night or not. Mm -hmm. And they kind of declared over the, when they used the 21 point test, that there was enough leading toward the contractor that they could qualify as a contractor. But I will say that within three weeks of the California Supreme Court coming out with this new ruling last year, the lawsuit was reopened hmm. for Grubhub. Yeah. And I know there's like Uber, there's, I mean, cause there are some, and it really comes down to where 
the three points, you know, it's, it's kind of the same thing because like Grubhub, Uber, they're trying to make it appear that all they're offering is the software and people are using it on their own for a business. That's kind of the biggest argument that I've heard mm -hmm. is that, all right, you know, it's like, well, you know, we're not out there, you know, gathering up. It's like we publicize our software capability, but people need to sign up and then access the software and use it for it to be of any effect. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of their argument. But, um, you know, and so, but some of it, it always comes down to um, control when it really boils down to it. Cause that's like number a on there is to how much control do you have? Because for a normal, if it, in a normal business environment, um, the control, the questions they're going to ask are, you know, are you providing the tools for this person to do their, their work? And a lot of times I hear about, oh yeah, they come in and we give them an office or a cube to use and, and, you know, oh, and we provide their tools for them and we, oh yeah, you know, they need to come in and we have to show them what we want them to do. And it's like, that's not a true independent contractor. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be hiring a contractor to provide an expertise your business doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So normally that's going to run into the realms of HR, um, marketing, accounting, um, you know, something like that. Um, you know, you could even have it be warehousing if you just manufacture and ship it off to this place to go do their thing and do the fulfillment. But you have to break it apart from what you, you do. I have a, one of my clients has an interior design firm and they've got one guy that works part-time for him and does some build out stuff when needed. And um, I asked an attorney about this. It's like, okay, you know, they're trying to keep him as a contractor. They actually had all their people as contractors. And then we brought him in last year as all employees. And with this con you know, construction guy, it was like, okay, can we keep him as a contractor? And the first thing the attorney said is like, is that capability published on your website? If so, it's one of your core offerings. Wow. You may not spend a lot of time doing it, but it's something you're selling. So my explanation is basically if whatever that contractor is doing literally touches your client, mm -hmm. it's a risky contractor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, can, I, can I ask a follow on to that then? Um, you know, I was in IT for many years and we frequently staffed up and staffed down for certain projects, you know, so maybe I needed one extra engineer or I needed an extra PM. And so I would just hire a contractor. Um, and that was what we called them. We called them contractors. And yet they really didn't meet any of that criteria. You know, I gave them a place to sit. They used our equipment because that was the security, you know, prevention. Um, they were certainly working under my direction or whoever was the head of that project direction. So, and I know that that practice still exists today. So is there something, some way that they're getting around that or? No, they're still just taking the risk. Wow. And, um, you know, I actually, last year I had a client and that was just before I think the ABC test came out, um, that biotech firm who hired, um, the year before I wasn't worth them, you know, working with them then, but the year before they'd hired a scientist to come in and create control cultures for them. And the whole point of having someone from outside is so that it is a control. It's not anything your people are touching. Mm -hmm. And so, because again, it was it needed the security of their lab and stuff like that. So they did have the scientists come in and over about a six month period, I guess they paid this person about, I think it was like 43 or 48,000 come April of the next year. Interesting timing. She filed with directly with IRS saying, I don't think I should have been a contractor. I think I should have been an employee now. And the reason they do that, and that's your biggest risk. I mean, really it's like the, where I see it come up most often that they get caught is either because the person didn't think of themselves as an employee, truly just didn't think of it. And so when the work stopped, they filed unemployment like they always do when the work stops. But then EDD says, oh, we don't show them on this company's database. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they want to come out and do an audit. So I've had companies caught that way. Um, I've also seen them where the employee will just turn them in. Um, like in this case, you know, IRS, because then what happens is, and, and the part I don't agree with, but I understand why it's out there is that there is no downside for the contractor who signs up for this. Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So I sign up as a, 
a fake independent contractor with Christine. So when the work stops, you know, I, you know, file unemployment, Edidi comes to Christine and says, oh, you know, what is going on here? Um, you know, this person's not on your, and so they'll come in and do an audit. Now from my side, I just trot away. I can disappear at that point. I walk away with the gross amount that I was paid. And if EDD decides that I should have been an employee, Christine's the one now who's going to have to pay all of the payroll taxes I should have paid. They're going to, she's going to have to pay if I stick around and say, you know, it turns out I, I wasn't even supposed to be salaried. I, I missed all those lunch periods and I worked on some weekends to try and get the project done. So now they've got wow. to sit and give me a check for all that unpaid time and the penalties for that. And then she takes the hit for that. So wow. the, the weight is completely on the company who misclassified that worker, which is why I go very conservative when someone asks me, it's like, okay, let's talk this through, you know, and, and cause I'll even get where somebody will try and hire somebody, but they've got an entity and they're trying to make the entity the, on the payroll. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, nah, it doesn't quite work that way. We need just the social. You can't use an EIN mm -hmm. when we're talking a company's payroll because it's going to somehow twist around. Wow. And, um, you know, so it's like either they need to qualify truly as a contractor or accept that they're going to be an employee. I actually had one attorney, an employment law attorney, who said that he could even make an argument for me needing to be an employee with all of my clients if, I, if he wanted to go truly conservative because he says well hr touches the whole business and it's like yeah okay because <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going to go there. crazy but, you know but you know it's like that's the problem we've got a lot of people out there who are used to doing that odd work for companies and i've i've helped a lot of companies transition from how used only contractors and now they have to make that switch because i think the biggest message i always have is that if i see a you know someone who has kind of the they're they're the one person business but they're actually have people working for them and they're all as contractors it's like bottom line is no matter how the laws work out that is not a long-term business model somewhere it's going to come back to bite you and um because you don't you know potentially you don't own the work Potentially, you know, they're going to, you know, they have the freedom to go out and, and grab all your clients away from you. And, you know, because even with employees, you know, there was a, a new law that or a new court case last fall that said that even now employees, you can't lock them into not contacting your clients. Mm -hmm. Only you can only hold them in while they're actually employed. The yeah. second they're not working for you, they can go out and target all your clients. So, you know, when you've got somebody who's actually set up as a business, you know, you want to be protective of your client and what they're doing for you and stuff like that. So it's, it is, you know, kind of redefining what that is, but it's, it's, there's still a big mess out there because there's so many types of workers that have done it in the contractor method and, um, you know, that they, they don't even know how. And, and so many companies are so against putting someone on for just a few days or for a couple of weeks on their, under their payroll. And it's like, in the end, you know, it's not that much paperwork and you don't have any of the risk when you do it that way. One of my clients, um, for six years, she's had a business where she had a small office staff and, um, and she's local in San Diego, but she has people that have worked for her throughout the United States. And over that period of time, there's probably 5,000 people that have worked for her. Because what she does is she plays that, I don't know what the PC term for middleman is these days, but she plays that intermediary between a company that has a new product, think even Costco food demonstrators. I've got a new product, I've got a new wine, I've got something, you know, they've got the car shows where you see all those demonstrators. So she will hook up the company and find an a person that will help them with whatever they're marketing. Mm -hmm. Now she had it set up to where she was running this through Facebook. She had um, a Facebook group she had started and you had to apply to be in the group. You had to show that you had actually been doing this as a living, mm -hmm. you know, that you, you know, moved from demonstration to demonstration kind of a thing. And, um, you know, and so they would, you know, come in when they got a new 
order in for a gig, you know, that she would put it out there for that group of people in that location. And, and it's like, I have this, here's what it's paying. You know, they have like a little 15 minute video you'll have to watch to know how to do, um, you know, and here's the dates of the gig and people within that had, were in her database would apply for it and they'd pick the best qualified one for that and then hook them into that gig. Two years ago, she got hit by New York and we fought that one off because she has it laid out very cleanly on how she does this. And, um, you know, and so that one never came to anything, but then she got hit early last year, just before the ABC test came out um, by EDG and EDG said, nope, we consider these employees. So, yeah. So in the last year, because then it was like followed up with the ABC thing, which really put a slam to it. So in the last year, she's had to hire 160 of the people in California. We haven't even gotten to the other states yet. So she's had to put on 160 employees for this little gig work that she puts together for them. And, you know, so it's become this huge thing. She hasn't even tried the other states yet, but there are other states that have similar contractor laws as California now has. So, you know, we're kind of looking to pick the, the most risky ones first and do that, but it's turned her into kind of the large employer. So now she has to deal with FMLA. She's had a horrendous time getting paperwork filled out by these people that are all remote, you know, that have never had to do new hire paperwork right. before. Right. And, you know, so it's, and, you know, and it's like, and technology keeps bumping up against HR because one of the things that came up was like the I-9. Yeah. You're supposed to look at that documentation. And so I talked to an immigration attorney. It's like, okay, if I've got my passport and I slap it up against my monitor so they can see it, will that work? And she had just come from a meeting in Washington and she's like, no, technology hasn't been approved by them yet. You have to literally see it. You can't see a copy of it. You're supposed to see the original. Now, what was funny, she said, was, well, you are required for a person to look at it. They don't care who the person is. So I made, I know it's like, so I made instructions so they could have their brother or their boyfriend look at their ID and finish filling out the I-9 so they could submit it. Now it's like, is that stupid? (laughs) Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But it's, it's like, that's how weirdly tangled it all is. You know, I'm running into the other, other thing that I keep bumping a lot into the technology issue is on um, sales reps. Because with all the capabilities of stuff like this now, Mm -hmm. sales reps particularly that are selling like a big item, they're doing it like remotely now. And I've had attorneys tell me, nope, again, that's not going to qualify and make them, that's going to make them only an inside sales rep, not the exempt outside sales rep. They have to literally be beating the pound, you know, the pavement, knocking on doors 51% of the time to still get that qualification. And there's not a lot of them that do it that way anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are some, like you get in the pharmaceutical, they're all out there not, you know, going to doctors, but others are doing more the remote to make it more efficient and stuff. But I've been told that that legally will not pass it. If they ever get audited, that's going to kick out. And well, the, your example of the, the, the woman that was the middleman for all of these mm-hmm. different things, um, that's a really great example of how convoluted it can be. And <laughs> kind of answered my question about how, can is a really tiny company exempt from this well it sounds like no i mean she no. has no employees but then she's got all these independent contractors all over the place so. yeah so nope you know it it's there is no size limit to this it's like you're you know so and what i thought mlms do they yeah, i thought i thought ab5 was um like the california chamber of commerce is asking people to call their legislator to try to put in that exemption for small businesses. So, well, so far they've not done anything though, you know, and until it's actually enacted and they, we've got a start date on it, there's nothing we can do. We can't rely on it. Cause I, I know I've got clients out there who are holding their breath, continuing to take the risk, waiting to see what evolves. But my experience has been, like I said, I'm still waiting three years later for the sick leave law to be a little better. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I'm like on the side of almost kicking that one out. But, um, you know, it's like the legislator moves so slow because they kind of get a part way through and then somebody comes up and all oh, this and that or it gets vetoed. And so until it's enacted, you can't depend on it. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, California has never been a state that allows ignorance of a law to be a defense. 
You know, it's like, no, 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 somehow you're supposed to have known about this. And, you know, and I hear this a lot from clients because I work, you know, since I work with clients that don't have inside HR, I get a lot of them that have never had any kind of HR knowledge or interactions. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of them even started a business because they were just good at something and they were maybe never in a true business model to see that HR even has a role. So a lot of times they were already into a problem before they even call me. And, but it's, you know, it would be nice if there was some kind of, of, I mean, when I started my business 13 years ago, that was one of the first things I did. I went on California side. I went on the small business administration site, looking to see what kind of help they were providing. And they don't. I mean, even now, 13 years later, I actually have one of my employees go out every quarter and double check that we're still using the most current version of each form that we have to give people because there's nothing that goes out from the government from California at all. And you think with email these days, they, they know how to find everybody when they're mm-hmm. in trouble, but they do nothing to let you know, Oh, we've created these new laws that you might, you know, might affect you. Right. Um, things like that. And, and it drives me crazy. I mean, last year alone, I had two industries that had new laws in place that, I didn't hear about, in fact, even my legal updates, and I go to like eight from law firms a year plus other things, none of them mentioned either of these. Wow. You know, one, one hit the cosmetology industry and one was the janitorial industry. And, um, you know, and I really hate that when they do that because then somebody's in trouble before they find out or, you know, that there's even this law out there. And when I don't hear about it, it's, it's such a, you know, minute little, thing that's brought up. I mean, the cosmetology one, I actually talked to a lot of people, including the the California chamber. Nobody can figure out how this even got put through. Because if you think about it, like your hairstylist, you know, they, most salons, the way they were always doing it was that they might get paid a small hourly, but they mostly, they kind of get a commission on what kind of service they provided. So this law took that ability away. It basically said, now you can only do the commission if they're earning two times minimum wage. Now, there's a lot of newbies out there, and there's a lot of small salons that do not pay $22, $24 an hour. And I actually, one of my clients has a very high-end salon and one that's a lower end. He said the high-end, that's not a problem because they're making big money. But the low end, he said, even with commissions, some of these people aren't making that two times minimum wage. And so they ended up just going to a flat hourly wage. Now you don't get commissions on what you do for the person, stuff like that. So it's like, okay, what made, and they were suggesting, they were actually suggesting that we go back to um, peace, you know, the peace rate, which was in legal chaos five years ago. So it's like, they come up with these things and it's like, who even thought to put that through when it was working so well the way it was? Yeah. And, you know, and so you got that, you got the janitorial service and I've got some janitorial clients and I call them and most of them hadn't heard about a law that last year, California put one in place that said that as of, well, it, it was enacted, it started July 1st and by October 31st, if you were doing any kind of janitorial, even if you were using independent contractors, unless you were a one person show, you had to register $500 register with the state and re-register every year. And if you don't register, you're subject to fines and penalties. And if someone hires you and you're not registered, that company is also subject to fines and penalties. <laughs> wow. And, and so again, nobody was talking about it at all. And you've got, you know, so I was letting my clients know, it's like, make sure that whoever you're using for janitorial has been registered. And, um, and frankly, I know, I have a feeling I know why that law got put into place. I think it was a sneaky backdoor move by the state to find those independent contractors because the janitorial service is well known for having that model. Sure. Where, you know, I mean, I had a client like six years ago get hit with that because he had learned it that way. And so he'd set up business that way. And it took me and an attorney three months to convince him that he needed to put him on his employees, but his 35, he had 35 contractors working for him. But when I told him he can't have anyone on the, on the job that isn't an employee, it turned out to be a hundred because they were bringing friends and family. What about the, you know, to go back to the cosmetology model, what happened to the days of you rented a chair 
in a shop. You can still do that, but most people don't fully understand that model um, because you can do a booth rental, but you have to mentally think of it as it's like an island. You can't touch it. You can't process payments for it. You can't set up appointments for them. Sure. They live and work on their own. And what you find most of the time and when you find the booth rentals is that they're like, okay, they're still having to dress like the rest of the people. Oh, the front desk is still making their appointments or processing payments for you things like that, which is now where they've entered the gray fit, area right? and it doesn't fit. Okay. It's truly like leasing a little piece of land. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got one, my guy that does my hair, because he's kind of gone through the whole thing of doing the contractors that wasn't legal. Then he was trying employees that were too much of a hassle. And so he finally went to booth rental. Yeah. And we actually put it into his booth rental contract that he would supply the like shampoos and conditioners that are at the sink just to make it life easier. And, um, but you know, it's like, it's it, most of them don't understand that it's that hands off. He actually wow. lost, he had three booth renters. He's got a small salon. He had three booth renters and one of them was so mouthy and talking about things and doing things that she, the other two left because of her. And so he got rid of her. So now he's very, very careful yeah. about who he hires. Right. Because, right. Because you know, you, you can't control, like they start saying, you know, non PC stuff around there, or they're talking about rates that are different from what other people are charging. It's messy. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and it's really hard to kind of find just the right people that understand that this is a professional environment. Yeah. Even though I don't have control over everything in your little corner, I don't want it to be that different from the rest of us, particularly when everybody can see and hear each other. Right, right. So, so you know, kind of to, um, to shift gears a little bit, um, what about the idea of being exempt versus being a, uh, an hourly employee? I mean, wouldn't it just be easier to just make everybody exempt and then you don't have to do time cards, you don't have to do any of that kind of stuff? Um, and is, you're laughing, is, I can tell. I, well, it is simpler because I get so many clients that want to go. I mean, they approach me, it's like, oh, you know, we'd like to make this person because, you know, they just don't like doing the time cards. You know, we don't have to do this. I'll, you know, they kind of argue it all the time. And you even get some employees that are at what should be an hourly, like an admin assistant is one of the most classic ones that mm -hmm. they won't even take the job unless they can be salaried. It's like, no, 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 I'm better than that. Yeah. And, you know, and it's funny because salary and hour, salaried and hourly are payroll terms versus the exempt versus non-exempt, which is the legal terms. So there, there was one company we actually made the admin salaried on payroll, but she was still non-exempt and had to still do the time card and everything else, which, and frankly, as soon as you go that route and make them salaried, you have to now go back and reconcile their time card to the pay they received every payroll period. So really, why did that make it any easier? And to me, I know they're, they're constantly trying to fudge as to why somebody qualifies. Mm -hmm. um, two, three years ago, the feds, and the feds are actually working on this. They want to make it harder to be exempt. They tried, I think it was three years ago, to raise it because California, we, we deal with higher numbers than other states do. You know, right now there's states out there that have an exempt employee who's only making like 21,000 mm -hmm. and they're in a management level position. Whereas California, you've got to be making close to 50,000, 45 or 50 right now to be considered, you know, I always start there when we're talking that it's like, all right, how much, first thing I ask is how much are you paying the person? Mm -hmm. Because if, you know, our, the salary is always going to be two times minimum wage, the state minimum wage. Um, not locals. So state minimum wage times 2,080 hours. So it, it's going to assume as an exempt person is always full-time pay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. period. So the rule is, I, you know, and you can't prorate it. So even if, Patty, I wanted to hire you for three days a month to come in and do my marketing or do this or that, I'm still going to have to pay you the full monthly amount in order to keep you salaried. Wow. you know, as an exempt person. Mm -hmm. Now you also, that's only one of the tests. And that's usually the easiest one for me because I have a lot of clients that are trying to go that direction. It's like, mm -hmm. all right. When I look at the position, it's like, okay, talk to me about this. Is this position, it's like, ignore the person. Is mm -hmm. this position in your company going to be worth 55,000 in a year? And they're like, oh no, I don't think I'll ever be paying that much. It's like, then don't go there. Mm -hmm. Because right now, depending on the size of the company, it's like, we're, the salaries are going up 5,000 a year because of our dollar a year minimum mm -hmm. wage going up. So 
I don't want to have somebody be made exempt salary right now and in January have to flip them back to hourly because I can't afford the new salary rate. Yeah. And um, because as soon as you have to do that, I mean, you really want to have the job be different mm -hmm. because otherwise it's going to, they're going to come like, well, why didn't I get paid for those missed lunches or for my overtime for that six months you had me as exempt. Yeah. And you know, and that's the part they don't get, but then also they don't get that you have to actually meet one of the federal exemptions. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, I mean, and one of the things in, to look at it, and I think it really puts it in perspective when you look at what the feds tried to do three years ago, they actually, because I attended one of their webinars on this when they were talking about it, and they were trying at that time to make the federal minimum just shy of 48000 Now, yeah, and for some of those states were, that are at twenty one, that was yeah. like huge. And so they got this huge uproar from the southern states because those are the ones at the lower pay scales. And that's, you know, and it actually got passed and it was like passed on the week of Thanksgiving and almost in the same week, a judge put a stop to it. <laughs> and because of the uproar from the South. Yeah. And, but they're back trying it again now. You know, they're trying to come up with another number that might be more, you know, doable for people. Mm -hmm. But the other part of that, that they did drop partway through the whole contest of the whole salary was the other thought was, since a lot of people become exempt when they are start to supervise people. Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, Christine, you're supervising two people. Yes, they might be part-time, but you're supervising two people. So now, you know, we can put you under the, you know, exemption for that. But then the feds came back and said, okay, if we really do the math on this, we're assuming full-time people. So we're assuming you're supervising 80 hours worth of people each week. But gosh, that means you become non-exempt when one of those people goes on vacation and they're not under you right then or cut back their hours, or they're only part-time. So they were trying to like build it up to, I mean, cause they're trying to make it harder to get to because of the way it was originally intended. It wasn't intended to be for everybody, you know, that's making, you know, 30,000 and, and above. It was meant to be truly almost a senior management type of exemptions out there or some specialty ones. And that's what they keep working on in the background trying to get something that they can get past and, and won't get thrown back out immediately. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of think it in that terms, it puts it a little more in perspective when, you know, I mean, I run across people that it's like <laughs> they're, I mean, it's like, it cracks me up because they're like, all right, I've got this person exempt and, and I'm thinking of giving them a raise. And it's like, well, what are you paying them now? And it's like, well, right now they're making 36,000. And it's like, wait, and you've got them exempt. It's like right now that's 12,000 below the current minimum, mm -hmm. you know, so how are you going to get them up there to keep them exempt? And, you know, I had one client who, who did it, who took the risk, but did it in two stages uh -huh. so that within about eight months, she'd have the person up at the level, but it's very hard to give somebody a bump. I mean, even when you hire somebody at too low of a rate and they really work out and be a great employee and a year later, you're kind of like, okay, we're going to give you an equity increase because we hired you for too low of an amount. You know, and it's like, it's, it's hard to have that person feel good about it. Yeah. To realize that they were that underpaid. Right. And, you know, and so it's like, and some people are better at kind of bluffing through and they're like, oh yeah, you know, you are worth a 25% increase. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you just <laughs> don't see people buying into that very often. Right. And, right. And that makes them start asking questions. And, and everybody seems to have also forgotten about all the equity laws we have out there now mm -hmm. for equi you know, equal pay. It's like, nobody really puts a lot of weight on those yet. Yeah. And, but I know the attorneys, when those first got passed, the attorneys flat out told me, it's like, we are the only ones who will make money on this, on these laws. You know, you know I, I was um, kind of to switch gears again here. Um, and Christine, please jump in if you've got anything to, um, to, to bring this back to a, a topic. Um, but I was working for a really small company not long ago. And, and this, I mean, by small, I mean, this company had like 13 employees and I was working with them as an employee and came on board to help grow the infrastructure and so forth because the company was posed to just go, you know, crazy. That didn't happen, but that's a whole nother story. But I, one of the things I said to them was, um, and CJ, this was because of some of the work you and I had done in the past together, you know, and I said, do you have an employee handbook? No, no, we don't, we don't need that. We don't need that. 
And I said, well, I, I think you might want to rethink that. And they had just brought a guy on to be in charge of HR. And he goes, well, I'll just get one off the internet. So he gets, he gets an HR manual off the internet. And, uh, and I said, well, can I see it before you push this out to the employees? And it was so crazy. I don't know where he got it from. And it was so old and it was so, you know, I mean, it just had some of the most archaic things. One of the things it had in it was, you know, you are forbidden to discuss salary with another employee. And yeah. I was like, okay, that's it right there. This whole thing is disqualified. Call an expert, get them in here to write us a manual, you know, but um, what, what do you tell companies when they say, yeah, we don't need a man. Everybody knows, you know. Well, and I've had a lot of different, I mean, cause I've done, you know, I think my record's like 24 handbooks in a year, you know, so I've done a lot of handbooks over the years. But, um, you know, and I've had different things happen. I mean, I don't push a handbook on a client until they've got maybe five or more employees mm -hmm. because usually, you know, it's, I mean, some of it, I, you know, to me, I mean, if somebody wants it at a smaller size, I am happy to do it because it's an education session for them sure. to learn what the laws are and stuff like that. But a lot of times they're just not needing it because at five you get your hit now with your subject to so many of the laws now it becomes really important you do understand what you're up against out there and um and i've i know i've got a client right now that's got 250 employees and they're using a off the internet handbook in fact the paid first page is still saying your name in, the, <laughs> in that section there <laughs> It's like, okay, they didn't even go to the trouble of trying to like completely personalize it. It's like, really? And, and it's like, I'm, I'm trying to convince them that they want to start fresh here. So, cause I mean, with handbooks, I mean, I've even years ago, I had the California chamber contact me because they've always had what was considered like a really good template for a, a handbook. And, but what they told me was that they were trying to line up some consultants to work with them that they could refer people that bought the handbook to because they kind of finally realized it was just a tool and that buying it didn't necessarily give you the knowledge to know how to implement it properly. Mm -hmm. and a lot of, a lot of companies that bought their software were, were tweaking it out of compliance, sure. you know, didn't understand it, stuff like that, you know? And so it's like, since they've been selling that software for a very long time, I was glad to see that they were finally recognizing that it, it's a great tool, but it's not the be all end all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had one client years ago that was a little biotech and um, the chairman of the board was Swedish and he w um, was, he had a company that was pretty much just a venture capital company. Mm -hmm. And so he was on the you know board of several of these companies and he, and the company only had like 10 employees at the time and they were getting a handbook from me and some other stuff. And, and it was so funny because he looks at this, he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I'm paring it down. I mean, he, he ended up with like 14 pages. He had cut out so much stuff. And he goes, no, you know, I always love this. These are adults. We don't <laughs> modern. <laughs> and you're kind of like, okay, that's fine. And so give him what he wants. And a year later, he contacted me, he goes, okay, bring back all those missing parts mm -hmm. because you find out you need that somehow that direction for the employees. Sure. I've also seen handbooks done by attorneys and I will usually try and convince a company not to go that route because it's not, even though it's compliant, it's not friendly. Mm -hmm. I've seen them where they write them up to look like a computer manual with, you know, 2.1, 1.3, you know, yeah. that kind of thing to where it's just not a friendly one. I have one client that's 35 employees and their handbook 21 pages out of their handbook was strictly about um, um, proprietary information. Mm. And uh, they, run, they run ads on Spanish TV. Yeah. It's, like, you know, it's, it's not, I know. It's like, really? It's like, put that as a separate something to sign if you really need 21 pages because the handbook doesn't need that much. You yeah. definitely cover it. And, you know, and it's like, and I've got some that'll have handbooks they'll send me, you know, that they've had for years or they got somewhere and I, for free, because it takes me like 30 seconds, I will go in and do a quick scan because I can tell, you know, I can tell for one, if it came from the chamber originally, because you, there's certain language that just never has changed. And, um, but what I do is if I'm doing their update, um, I also tell them it doesn't come with my warranty you know, a guarantee that my original handbook comes with. Because mm -hmm. if I have to spend the time 
to read through every single paragraph in that handbook they've given me, they will have spent far more than what it would cost them to just start fresh. Right. With one I know is compliant. Right, right. So I tell them, it's like, I'll work, you know, I'll focus on the, the areas in the handbook that I know are most susceptible to mm -hmm. claims and do that. And, um, but, you know, it's like, when you know they've got something if it, even on the ones that i created you know somebody comes back like 10 years later it's like really <laughs> it's like yeah. this is just about like starting fresh um you know but at least with mine i mean i've kept track of like changes that have gone on so that we know what to go look for but it's you know i think they're important in the sense that it helps provide direction but even more importantly i think it also for especially for smaller companies it helps the managers and the owners of the company know what they can and can't do yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because in the process of doing a handbook, you know, we'll go through it and ask, answer all those questions. It's like, well, do we need that in there? And it's like, well, it's not legally required that you have it, but here's why I keep it in here. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You know, and things like that, because they, they don't have any idea of what goes in there. Right. And, um, you know, and some of them I'll see do weird, like six page little here's all of our policy stuff yeah. on their own, you know, like their own little handout that they do. And, you know, and some of it's legal, some of it's not, some of it's not explained nearly well enough. And, you know, today, I mean, there's little things that go in handbook that, um, you know, one of the things I've always, I've had in mind for several years now is about leaves of absence and covering them up for insurance because I've actually talked to an attorney and unless they're on like a protected leave, like workers comp, um, where they're getting their medical coverage, but um, your handbook is the only thing that says how long you'll keep somebody on your insurance while they're on a leave of absence. Wow. So if you don't put it in there, then you have to, it takes, you're, you're paying for it longer. Right. Because now it's like, okay, now we have to send them a letter telling them when we're going to move them to Cobra, but it's going to be at least a month out. Mm -hmm. So you've incurred extra cost along the way because it wasn't spelled out up front that we're going to only keep you, you know, on our, on our insurance plan for 30, 60, 90 days, whatever. Right. And, um, you know, it's like the pregnancy law forces you to keep them on longer, but, mm -hmm. uh, Otherwise, it's like I've had one client years ago, had somebody who had not been working because he had been a 25-year-old kid, got diagnosed with a terminal brain something. Mm -hmm. and, but the, my client had kept him on the insurance for two years after this. And, you know, and the guy couldn't work at all and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, we have to start pulling him away. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and doing something here because he's still alive, but he's not able to function. Right. You know, stuff like that. So you kind of get caught up in things like that. If you don't have some things that you've thought through, mm -hmm. then a handbook makes you think through. Right. Because right. when I, I start my handbooks with a questionnaire for the client, and a lot of times, especially at small clients, they'll, they'll come back, the questionnaire will come back with, don't know, don't know, don't know. Yeah. Or you sure. talk about it, and which is fine, because I kind of like know what to throw in as a standard. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to talk with them about it once they can see the first draft and see it in context. Right. You know, why we ask this question, you know, let's talk about whether or not this works for you. Right. Uh, right. You know, it's doing things like the sick leave law. If you don't have an, uh, an actual policy, you can't actually legally limit how much sick time they use. You have to have a written policy. Really? And, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, you can say, oh, you know, it's California or San Diego. It's like, you can only use the 48. It's like, but if you didn't put it in writing in a policy, because there's no, nothing in the law that's, that says that they say you can do as little as that, but there's nothing that says it's limited as long as they have the time available. And, you know, so you need that, you know, you've got, um, handbook can cover it, but I'm pretty much still keeping it as a sep an additional separate, the sexual harassment prevention plan because California, you know, those new laws after the Me Too were that you needed more detail. You needed to make sure somebody was following through to make sure it was staying on track and continuing. Because I've had clients that, oh, you know, well, we did something. It's like, well, no, it, it kind of stopped here and then nothing happened. Yeah. And, you know, things like that. And that law was the first time that they actually designated how and when you had to translate it. Because that harassment one said that you, if you have 10% or more of your workforce speaking another language at work, then we assume it's the most comfortable language form and you have to translate your, that policy into that language for them. Wow. 
And, wow. you know, so even though Spanish in California is the biggie, we have a lot of other dialects out there that mm -hmm. are spoken. A lot of times it depends, you know, because it's, it's kind of like I've seen companies that when they start hiring, you know, different staff and they start getting people from different, you know, a whole diversity thing. It's like you get more of them because then they, they tell their friends. It's like sure. where people live in communities, you know, it's comfortable right. for them to be around others that they can speak their language to occasionally or, or you know have a common background, things like that. So it pops up. But yeah, that was the first time we had a law that actually specified you had to translate. And here's exactly what the rule is. Wow. Wow. So as you can see, Christine, see, I can just keep talking all the time. Is there anything else that you wanted to have me cover while you're on? <laughs> it's like, Patty, and I can just keep going all afternoon. Well, I, I was going to ask, you know, when you, when you brought up the sexual harassment, I was going to ask if you had sort of an uptick in questions and so forth from your, your clients after all of that started coming up. Like, did they want to review their policy or did they suddenly realize they needed a policy or... No, the, uh, the biggest change right after the Me Too thing was that some of the business owners... Um, refused to, to meet alone with any employee, sure. male or female, sure. after that, you know, and, and it's a little tricky with a smaller organization because you may not have a third person. It's not like you got HR that can go in and sit in the room. So right. sometimes they do the open door or they go out somewhere in public, something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the biggest outcry has been since the new law about having to have the training done this year. Yeah. And, um, you know, cause I created some on demand webinar training and I, so in my newsletters, it's been reminding people that they need to do it. So I've been getting a lot of that. And um, it's, you know, and people are upset because of the cost mm -hmm. more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, cause I mean, I, I hate that we've had to force it, but I also understand why it's happening because a lot of the claims I've been part of before has been because the people making the claim don't truly really understand what true sexual harassment is. Right. You know, my supervisor yelled at me today, so I'm in a hostile work environment. And it's yeah. like, no, it's like he might be a bad, has a bad manager style, but it's not necessarily harassment unless it really is focused on protected characteristics of some type. Sure. And, um, you know, and so that's been an interesting evolution this year because there's so, you know, so many companies have been out looking for the training mm -hmm. and we've learned a lot. I mean, um, nobody I've talked with will use the Cal Chambers. Um, because I've got, uh, it was actually a referral from another consultant who does the live training, but they also had 300 employees. They wanted the on-demand and they looked at the Cal Chambers and um, Cal Chamber apparently, I've not actually watched it myself, but apparently literally leads the employee by the hand on how to file a claim and to find an attorney. And while the requirement is you're supposed to train on what harassment is, mm -hmm. it's not a requirement that you, you know, give them everything that they need to know to go out there and file that claim. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's like some limitations. And so companies aren't willing to kind of provide that much information. And, you know, frankly, it's not that hard to find, you know, a resource if you're really looking for it, but um, it's, it's opened up a lot of questions. I know with, there was an online resource I had been using for years to refer my clients to because the on-demand has always been easier mm -hmm. for them than trying to get everybody into a room. And when I actually started looking at it because, you know, more carefully and went in to review it, it's like, oh my gosh. And I had another client with a hundred employees that was using this software and I went in to test it and it's like, okay, they can fast forward through this thing. So their two hour training is taking like 15 minutes. Right. And so it was like interesting to see some of the, the services that had been offering training before had to go in and revamp their training because it wasn't actually compliant ever. Right. We just right. didn't pay attention to it as much before. Right. And so that's been kind of the biggie now. And, and it's like, I wanted to do the on demand because I, I already was offering some webinars, live webinars on it, but it took me a long time to find a platform I could use that wasn't like 15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I could use that would actually let me keep people from fast forwarding through it or, you know, to kind of force the whole thing. And, it was an interesting, challenging process yeah. because what I can do, the, you know, my normal presentation didn't work. Um, I can spend, you know, as you can see, I can talk. So I can take my, you know, my PowerPoint and do the one hour. I can do the two hour right on the dot. 
when I put it into the platform and went through it, it was 22 minutes. Yeah. Instead of an hour. Yeah. And it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. You know? And so it's like, all right, apparently when I'm recording pieces at a time, I'm not talking as much. So I had to go in and completely revamp mine again. Yeah. But it's, it's been a process on doing that. And so I think, but most of the clients, it's like not so much that they object to the training in and of itself. They object to the fact that it's paid time. So they're having to pay the employee for the hour or the two hours and they've got to pay to have the, to get the training. Mm -hmm. So they're seeing it as an extra expense, an expense and, yeah. you know, and I think if they've not had any claims or any, anything that concerned them in the past to them, it's an unnecessary expense. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, to me, I think it's helpful for people to better understand what qualifies yeah. both from the manager side. And, and a lot of managers are very surprised to learn that they could be held personally responsible. Sure. They kind of, I think in the mind, in the back of the mind, they've always assumed, Oh, it's all in the company, no matter what right. I do. Right. And the company will cover me. And it's like, no, you know, you could end up being fired. It depending on what had happened. Sure. And having to do your own attorney now. Yeah. So it's got a lot of potential consequences if you don't pay attention to what you're doing. And I mean, and it's hard because there's some companies that are very relaxed, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And it's not a big deal in there. Um, but you get in that one temp or you get in that one new employee who's got a slightly different set of, you know, moral... Yeah rules and on what they say and stuff like that yeah and um, comfort people get comfortable it, i know yeah they do and it's like so you know that's always my biggest message on the on the training is like make sure you know what you who your audience is and that includes all those people you can't see in the cubes back there that are still within hearing distance true because yeah. you know it doesn't matter if this little group right around you is comfortable with what you're saying anyone overhearing it can file a complaint exactly and it's like you know why do you need to go there? Take it outside of work if you want to get raunchy or something like that. Yeah. But well, CJ, this has been fascinating. And, <laughs> and I, I agree. I mean, this is a topic we could probably talk about all day long. But um, how do people reach you? How do they, if they think they might have an issue or they've never thought about it and they realize maybe I should be thinking about this, how can people reach you? Um, easiest thing is to just email me at cj at hrjungle.com or go to my website and, um, you know, and, and it's like, I give you the phone number, but nobody's going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> just, and, and I will mention, yeah, yeah, yeah your website, hrjungle.com has tons of great little videos and blogs and, um, downloadable things, you know, so it, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. And uh, yeah, and I do a weekly newsletter of just things and it's a, like a short, easy read um, that gets a lot of good press. I mean, it goes out to like 700 people each week and they, I know many of them actually pass it out to their clients and stuff like that. And because it's, because it is so short and to the point. And so, you know, if that's of interest, you know, I encourage you to sign up for that. Yeah. I, I highly encourage everybody to, I get that newsletter and I always find it interesting. Well, I wanted to thank you again, CJ, um, for being with us today. And thanks to everybody who's joined it. And thanks to those who listen to these afterwards. We know that, that folks are going and listening to them if they missed it, or if they can't remember something that was said, they're going back and listening to them. So I'm really glad to have uh, the audience that we do on Ask Me Anything. And be sure to watch all of our other online forums. They're designed for you. They're designed for the busy, busy professional who just needs to get information sort of on the fly and, and put it into their toolkit. So be sure to watch for the next ones that are being advertised and be sure to visit CJ's website, hrjungle.com. And until next time, thank you and look Thanks, forward Patty. to seeing you all again. All right. Take care. Bye.